Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge. The way the cockpit is designed, the highest rated green building in the world. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Welcome to the St. Louis University Earthquake Center for today's program, The Science Behind Earthquakes, New Madrid 200th Anniversary. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the Earthquake Center here at St. Louis University and to introduce you to our guest who's going to join us for this program, Dr. Robert Herman from the University. Bob, thanks so much for being here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, first of all, let's give the students a little bit of information about you. What is it you do here, Bob, and let's talk about the Earthquake Center. I'm a seismologist. That means I, I use mathematics and computers to study the earth and to study earthquakes. So here at St. Louis University we've had uh, earthquake studies for over a hundred years and uh, currently we are operating uh, seismograph stations within about seven states of, of St. Louis and we're looking at earthquakes not only in our area but uh, earthquakes that are worldwide. So the Earthquake Center is connected worldwide, so you guys are knowing what's happening all over the place. That's right. Everything's connected now by, by <laughs> the Internet, by satellite, and we all exchange uh, data and information. This program, you're going to get the chance to learn what the Earthquake Center does. We're going to find out what is the nature of earthquakes, why and how they occur. We're also going to be looking at some equipment. You're going to see some equipment throughout the program, both equipment that's been used in previous years as well as used today. And you're going to have the chance, obviously, if you're an interactive school or you're watching us over the Internet or television, to ask your questions. To our video conference schools, I'll ask you to remember to keep, please keep your microphones muted until I come to you for questions and then, un, then unmute them and then mute them again after you've asked your question. To those of you joining us via the web or television, television, then realize you can email us your questions to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. I've got my phone right here because they're going to text those questions to me. And so hopefully during the program we'll hear them and we'll know that we're getting those email questions to do. Bob, I think we should just start with what is the nature of an earthquake? You know, the earth splits. What are we talking about when we talk about what an earthquake is? Well, what an earthquake is is just a sudden movement between two pieces of rock and either the earthquake causes the first split, breaks the rock for the first time, or the earthquake um, occurs on an existing fault or a zone of weakness in the earth. So there are forces within the earth that are trying to move things apart and all of a sudden uh, the forces overcome friction, there is the rapid movement, uh, that causes seismic waves to go out which causes shaking and damage and uh, there's also deformation of, of the ground nearby. And so the earth is constantly moving because we're dealing with the plates of the earth, the fact that there's, they're moving against each other? That's right. The, um, the earth is a big heat engine. Uh, the earth is responding to the movement of transfer of heat within the earth and that causes the outside surface of the earth to continually move. And many, many of our, uh, the students listening in today are from earthquake areas and they know all about feeling earthquakes. And that's something we're going to give our interactive schools a chance to see, the likelihood of earthquakes in your particular region. First though, we want to look at some maps that are going to give you the idea of where earthquakes occurred or why. Our global map will show you, you'll really be able to see what's known as the ring of fire when we look at the global map uh, that gives you the idea of where earthquakes are happening around the world. And you can see it right there up on the screen now, all that red indicating where those are located. If we then switch to our next image, you'll see what we referred to a moment ago as those different plates of the earth something known as plate tectonics, and you'll see that there's all sorts of plates, and they just basically float on the Earth's like molten core? How yeah, that? well, the, the upper part of the Earth, down about 60 miles, it's warm enough that the rock is actually soft. So over geological time, not human time, um, the surface of the Earth can actually move over that. It's, it's, it's soft enough that there it happens. And we're going to zoom in next with our next image and look at a map of the United States. You can see the likelihood of U.S. earthquakes occurring in different parts of the United States. And you see that now, obviously, the darker color being the likelihood that it's going to happen more often. And notice, we're located in St. Louis, which is right there at the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi, well, just south of the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. And you see just south of us where the location is for the New Madrid Fault. You see all of that dark color along California, the San Andreas Fault. You see all of that dark color obviously in Alaska. We're going to look at some examples of earthquakes from all of those locations as we go into today's program. But let's talk, now that we know where they are, about how they occur. And we've got some animations to show the students as well, but I've got this piece of 
wood here, this shim here, right. and what we're going to use it for, Bob. Okay, well, this is going to be a demonstration of what happens during the earthquake. And we know that if we put enough force on this stick, uh, the kids are strong enough and can bend a pencil. They know they can break a pencil. Well, several things are going to happen. If I put the force on it, um, we know it's going to break. We'll also see, hear it because it's going to generate some sound waves. So if I do this, you know, we, we saw several things. We saw it did break at a place, so this caused the fault. The sound would be uh, similar to the seismic waves going apart from an earthquake. Now, we all know, you know, that if you uh, sound travel somewhat slowly, we all know that, you know, looking at lightning and listening to thunder, how far the thunderbolt was away, um, we can look at the, the earthquake waves generated and actually use that to say how far away the earthquake was from, you know, the observer. And you're going to have the chance to learn more about that as we talk about some of the equipment and how it's utilized. Let's take some animations we were able to find of different types of earthquakes and how they occur and in essence show you via animation what we were just talking about here. The first example is going to be what's known as a convergent where I'm assuming the plates are coming together, they're moving the plate, in on each other. That would be uh, what's happening just south of Alaska as the Pacific plate bumps into the North America plate. And those type of earthquakes cause the real great earthquakes, like the 1964 uh, Great Alaskan earthquake, uh, the recent earthquake in, in Japan, um, and almost, uh, almost all earthquakes off the west coast of South America. So in the news last year, we had, in the last 12 months, we had the earthquake in Chile, we had the earthquake in uh, uh, Japan, um, that were all associated with that type of a plate boundary. So in that instance, what you're seeing is a convergent earthquake. We're being joined by some people in Alaska in our afternoon program. They'll probably have some specific questions about that. The next animation we want to give you is what's called a divergent thing. And in this instance, I assume they're moving away from each other? Yeah, that's where the plates are moving apart from each other. And when they move apart from each other, the hot and molten material come, comes up from the inside of the Earth. Uh, what we'll see there is we'll see volcanic activity. We'll, of course, we'll see earthquakes. Uh, one place where this is happening on the surface of the Earth is the island of Iceland. And it's a volcanic island sitting right on top of the mid-Atlantic mid ridge. Uh, Iceland continues to grow because it's pulling apart. Hot lava comes up and adds, adds new material there. Uh, if the students look at any map, they'll see the, uh, of the globe. They'll see this pattern uh, right in the center of the oceans, and it, it encircles the, the world. And is that true of Hawaii in the same way? Hawaii or is, Hawaii is Hawaii's different? completely different. So we can come back to that after we talk about the, the third <laughs> type of uh, uh, the plate tectonic boundary. Which is strike slip. Yeah, and that's where the two sides are moving horizontally with respect to each other. And uh, there are several places in the world where there are major earthquake faults where you see that, the San Andreas Fault in California. And the other one is called the Anatolian Fault, which is on the north side of, of Turkey, just south of the Black Sea. Um, but all these faults are connected together, where you have a, a divergent uh, uh, plate boundary at one place, that'll be connecting into strike slip, and those may be in turn connected into a convergent plate boundary. So these are different ways that, that two plates moving on the surface of the Earth can move with respect to each other. They can move horizontally, they can pull apart, or they could bump into each other, uh, or they could bump into each other in a different way, which forms big mountain ranges. And Hawaii is all based on volcanic activity? Or? Hawaii is a little bit different. It's as if there's a, a um, hot molten materials coming deep from in the interior of the Earth, and it's popping through a moving plate. And the neat thing there is it pops through, the plate moves, and you get a whole range of islands. So if the students will look at a geographical map, they'll see that, or a map, they'll see that Hawaii is actually a long string of islands. If they look at a map that has the history of seafloor, they'll see some up to the northwest, some buried islands, which were part of the same thing. Oh, very good. We're going to go to some student questions now at this point. We're interested in your questions about the nature of earthquakes. Later in the program, we're going to talk about the equipment, and we're going to talk about the New Madrid earthquake specifically. Oh, and I heard our first email come in from the text message. That's good. I'll get to that internet question as well. Let's go up to Yonkers, New York, where I know we're being joined by a group of students at the Educational Opportunity Center. Yonkers, unmute your microphone. Come in, say hello. Do you guys have a question? I would like to know the difference between volcanoes and earthquakes. Okay, great. Bob. Well, well, they're, they're completely different. I mean, the volcano is the hot molten material coming up from the, the surface of the earth, I mean, from the interior of the earth, punctures through, you have lava flows, you have explosions. Um, 
when the volcano comes up and pushes the earth apart, it might cause earthquakes, but the big thing is the movement of the hot molten material. The earthquake is just a movement between two points on, on the uh, two surfaces of the earth. The earthquakes can, don't have to occur where volcan volcanoes occur. Thanks for that clarification. Yonkers, thanks very much for your question. Let's go to Wisconsin next, Chippewa Falls. A question from you guys. How do earthquakes form? How do earthquakes form? Well, that's part of what we were just talking about in the different ways. And, and Bob, what would you add to that in terms of how they form? Well, earthquakes occur because there are forces within the earth which are going to want to move the rock. And the earthquakes are really the sudden movement of the rock. We know that earthquake, you know, that you can have movement that takes a long period of time, such as the building of mountains, but the earthquakes occur very, very fast. So even the big earthquakes might only last tens of seconds, or at most uh, 60 seconds. So the movement is very, very fast. So it's a quick movement, and we're actually seeing that quick movement right here? Yeah, what we we're doing here is we, we have seismograph stations throughout the Midwest, and uh, all the data are coming in here live, and we're just watching how the ground is moving at different localities. So, Bob, I'll have you switch over to this side right. so we can so see it a little bit Right, so what better. we have here in the top, we have St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, we have other locations, um, eastern Illinois. So we're just watching how the ground moves. So this, the ground's always moving. Uh, we'll see later that anybody walking by a seismograph will cause the ground to move. We will also, um, uh, other things, if the wind blows, if animals are going by, or automobiles <laughs> go by, all that causes the ground to move, and we'll see that on our instruments. What we're really looking for is a very special type of pattern which is only generated by, by earthquakes. And you guys are going to notice, you won't necessarily be able to see it because it's such a small movement, but things are consist continually happening here, and we're just watching it as it goes across so they're able to read it continually. Before we go to uh, looking at some of this old equipment, we want to give each of our locations an opportunity to see the likelihood of earthquake hazards in those particular regions. And we've gotten some maps that have been developed that we've, we've found. So we're going to start with Arizona. First of all, look at Arizona earthquake hazard, and then we'll look at what's called the seismicity, how many of those earthquakes has happened. So let's go to the earthquake hazard map for our friends out in Surprise, Arizona. In this instance, we're not seeing a, there is some real likelihood that they're going to feel some earthquakes. Just, they're so close to California and the San Andreas and Baja, California. Right. The big, big places would be the southwest western corner, which is right close to the San Andreas Fault, right down by Mexico and uh, Southern California, and also up in the northwest, which is getting uh, close to Nevada. And you can tell in the second map, which actually deals with the number of earthquakes between 1990 and 2006, you'll see a whole bunch of orange dots in the lower left-hand corner, which would be the southwest corner of Arizona, and then obviously southeastern California, just so you guys can see right. from an Arizona perspective the amount of earthquakes that has happened. From Arizona, let's go up to upstate New York. Well, Yonkers, New York, not upstate necessarily, but there we are in New York. And again, it is in upstate New York where we'd be getting the yeah, earthquake potential. The, historically, the larger earthquakes have been on the sort of the New York, uh, Canada, uh, Canada boundary between New York and Quebec. Uh, big earthquakes, historic earthquakes, uh, 450 years ago have occurred just north of New York in, uh, in Canada. There have also been smaller earthquakes down in the southeastern, I mean, down near New York City mm. and uh, northeastern New Jersey. Um, and periodically, people in New York do feel earthquakes. I'm sure the students felt it's the earthquake last August 23rd. There was a magnitude 5.7 earthquake in Virginia that was widely felt throughout the eastern United States. So I'm sure many of them did feel it. Very good. So New York, there you have a sense. Let's go to Wisconsin. And so you guys in Chippewa Falls can see the likelihood of earthquake hazards in your area. We'll bring up that image next. Now here, we're not seeing very much, Bob. We're not seeing much because um, there aren't many earthquakes there. Uh, on the map, the hazard map, you'll see the southern part of the state is a little bit high in terms of, you notice the color's not a bright red, mm -hmm. a little bit high as far as expected ground motion, and those are mostly due to earthquakes down near Chicago. But it really, um, Wisconsin is not what we would consider a very active area for, for earthquakes. We go, let's go to some of this, these email questions that we've gotten. They're asking here specifically, thank you, Bakersfield, California, about the Marianas Trench. How is the Marianas Trench related to plate tectonics and the well, source? Well, basically, any, any, what there are, what a trench is, is a deep depression in the, open, in the ocean floor. And there are some trenches, the, the Marianas, that if you would slice off Mount Everest from sea level to the top and you'd flip it over, it would not hit the bottom of the Marianas Trench. 
What that's doing is the seafloor is being pushed down deep. The plate's going down deep. It's depressing the seafloor, and you get a big, what's called a trough, very deep water there, you know, some, on the order of uh, 10,000 meters at least. Oh, my gosh. Well, the, the next question is going to take a nice transition for us, create a nice transition for us as we look at some earthquake footage. This comes from Parkway Schools here in St. Louis. How loud would an earthquake be, like in Japan last spring? Is, the, is what you hear, do you actually hear earth rumbling as well as buildings, you know, moving around? Well, the earthquakes, the, the movement is actually, would be a, a very low frequency movement. What we will hear is the rattling as it causes the building to move. And you know, if you're going to have a big earthquake, things are going to fall off. And we all know that if you drop a glass and it breaks, you're going to hear it. So what you will really hear is the, the, the effects of the earthquake, the damage, the collapse of buildings. Um, the earthquake motion itself may not be, be that high that you could, the high of frequency that you could hear. And Japan is an example of earthquakes that we're actually going to see in the video footage we're going to run for you. We've talked the nature of earthquakes. We've talked why they occur. Now let's see what happens when they occur. And this video montage will give you some examples both of the recent Japanese earthquake, some footage, archival footage of the damage after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, California, and some footage from the Alaska earthquake in 1964. We'll roll that now. So here we're actually looking at what would be 1906 San Francisco, California. And this was a pretty huge earthquake, right, Bob? Yeah, this is the, the largest earthquake in the continental United States that, that we know about from the historical record. Um, the big thing about this earthquake, or the big lesson learned, is we learned that we have to have water supplies to put out fires. The earthquake did damage, but the real problem is it disrupted the, the, um, the water supplies for the fire plugs. And so when the fire started, uh, they couldn't put the fires out. So every earthquake Suddenly the whole harbor lessons. of Valdez is sucked We can dry. learn from it so that we can prepare for the next one. And we switch now to Alaska. This earthquake was in interesting the Alaska, because the ocean uh, in the Anchorage area, which is the big population area in Alaska, what had happened is there was severe shaking that caused the ground to collapse. So we learned about this fat feature called liquefaction. Um, we also know that this earthquake uh, caused a big tsunami, a, a big sea wave that uh, affected cities in Alaska, and also uh, there were some fatalities in California. And this, this is, is the recent earthquake from last spring of Japan, grocery store, obviously, and this is a big earthquake, seven... Th this is one of the world's largest earthquakes. It's, it's almost a magnitude nine earthquake. What we know today is that everyone has, maybe not everyone, has cell phones with video cameras. We have the internet, we have um, various things on the internet. After a big earthquake, we're going to be able to participate in that earthquake by seeing what had happened. This is something, you know, the world has changed, and so we're all part of, the world, part of this together. Thanks very much, Bob. And those images are really important. We wanted to give you a chance to see them. We're about to talk about this equipment, but we figure you students might have some additional questions on earthquakes before we get to those equipment. Yonkers, New York, let's go back to you guys again in New York. Another question for Dr. Herman about earthquakes before we begin to look at this equipment? What causes aftershock due to accidents? What is, what is the nature of an aftershock, Bob? Well, basically, when you have a big earthquake, there's a movement, but that movement also causes the places near the earthquake to be stressed and be ready to break. So the aftershock is sort of the continued uh, cracking, and these things will continue on. Uh, we know about the earthquake in Virginia last August. Well, we still get about a magnitude 2 earthquake every day there from that, z that zone. So the earth is still recovering from that big disruption in the past. Well, very good. And Yonkers, you had a second question. Let's go to your second question now. Can they predict earthquakes like they predict the weather? Oh, that's a great question. We're going to talk a little bit about predictability in the end of our program. But the question is, can they predict earthquakes like they predict the weather? And of course, weather predictions are not all that reliable to start with. That's a different topic for a future program. But talk well, about we it. cannot predict the earthquakes as to what's going to happen in the next day or in the next year. We can talk about long-term trends. So, for example, in California, we have evidence that big earthquakes should occur on the order of every several centuries, every 200 or 300 years. And if it's been that long since a one in the past, we should worry about it in the future. And that's a big concern in the planning in California. In other places, um, such as here in the central United States, we know we've had big earthquakes. We don't really know why we've had big earthquakes, but 
we build that into those hazard maps that you saw earlier with, with the, the colors. So on the basis of recent earthquakes, the basis of what we've learned about how these earthquakes repeat, we've got those maps that say this is where, where the hazard is. Um, you know, it would be nice to predict earthquakes <laughs> what happens tomorrow um, or in a few, few minutes or so. We can't really look into the earthquake as well as we can look into the air to predict the weather. That's a great question, Yonkers. And you mentioned the hazard map, right. hazards of, of, of the Missouri area. We've got a couple of maps that show you that. The likelihood of uh, earthquakes happening in the Missouri area and the seismicity of that. So let's bring those images up for you as well, because obviously the New Madrid quakes, which first began, well, the series of New Madrid quakes in 1811 and 1812, the first one was December 16th of 1811, right. and then there was another one in Jan late January and again in February of 1812, and of course there were aftershocks and all sorts of things in between, but this Missouri map shows you, and that's part of what you're talking about, the hazards. Right. We know that an earthquake's going to happen again here, we just don't know exactly when. Right, and what the maps are going to be used for, they're going to be planning for emergency response, they're going to be used to guide the constructions of buildings that would be safe to withstand a future earthquake. Very good. Let's go back to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Chippewa, do you guys have another question for Dr. Herman? Actually, we have two. Let's go to two questions then. How long do earthquakes last? Oh, Olivia, that's a great question, and it's going to depend, I think, on the size. How long do earthquakes last? Um, they can, if you have a very tiny one, they're over, you know, they're over in a uh, blink of an eye. Very big ones might last for, for minutes, and that has to do with how fast this fault actually moves. And this fault moves something, oh, on the order of about oh, two, three thousand, uh, four thousand feet per second. So um, if you have a big earthquake like the, the earthquake in uh, 2004 that, that uh, caused the tsunami that, that killed so many people, uh, you're talking about the whole, from the beginning to the end of, oh, maybe five minutes or so. Wow, that's a long time to right. feel the earthquake. And that was a big feet. earthquake. Wow. But normally for the earthquakes that affect my area, magnitude fives or so, uh, the earthquake is done and over in about a second or so. Wow. Just a quick snapping of the earth. Chippewa Falls, you had a second question. What is it? Is there an alarm or a siren to know that there is an earthquake? Oh, is there any kind of alarm or siren system? To know that here's an earthquake coming, or are, are, are people working on what, that? What we can do is that even though you know earthquake waves travel very fast, they're not as fast as radio waves or anything else. So it is possible, and people are studying that in Japan, that if you can quickly locate the earthquake and it's far enough away from you, you may have 10, 20, or 30 seconds to respond. And we can have equipment that turns off power supply or gas main uh, 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 lines to you know, prevent fires. So these types of alarms are using the science of how long it takes for this, the motion to travel from the earthquake to the place it's going to be shaken. So we can respond quickly, um, and people are looking at this. And, Wonderful. Those are great questions. I'm going to go to a couple more text questions we've gotten here as well. Um, when a fault moves a little often, like if it's moving a lot, is it releasing enough pressure to not have a big one? Great question, Bakersfield, California. Not really, because uh, we might say, you know, what, what is a magnitude uh, 5 earthquake? What would be 10 magnitude 4s? We have to look at, you know, how many of these little ones it would take to be equivalent to a big one. And so, you might take a hundred fours to make a six or a thousand fours to make a, um, a magnitude seven earthquake. Um, it would, those little ones don't occur that frequently to, to relieve the pressure. And Parkway wants to know, is standing under a doorway still a good protection idea? or should we? Basically, be what you've got to worry about, if you're in an earthquake or even you know, a, a tornado around here in the Midwest, you don't want to be injured. You want to be protected from things falling on your head. You want to be away from glass coming in from windows. So one thing that they, they recommend is to get under something sturdy. Uh, if you're a teacher's desk, it <laughs> would be a good place. These are good wooden desks because they're good strong. Good to know in case we have something. Because you know, if you look at any classroom, we have a lot of stuff in the classroom, the ceiling tile. With any shaking, that'll come down. So the important thing is to find some place where you know, cover your heads, duck and cover, so that you're not, nothing's going to hit you and injure you, and then uh, be calm, and then just get away from the buildings. Uh, 
When you go outside, watch out for cars so you don't get run over by cars. We're going to go to more interactive questions and more email questions. Don't forget it's live at HECTV.org. But we've got this equipment here. We want to give the students a chance to look at it and ask some questions about it. And we're going to start with this fabulous paper. This is actually an example of a seismogram. Yeah, what, what we have, seismogram comes from two Greek words, seismos to means earthquake and gram, which means the writing. And what we have in the old instruments, we were recording on photographic paper or we were recording in pen and ink. And we have time would increase on, you know, from left to right on these, uh, from top to down. So this whole piece of paper represents a one-day recording. For us to be able to look at and figure it out, we have little time marks. The time marks indicate the minutes. We might have longer time marks. Uh, they, you, they might be able to see this that indicates that those are minute marks. So normally as time goes on, we'll just see little wiggles going back and forth because the earth is always moving, but there may be an earthquake. And this is a recording of an earthquake in um, the state of Arkansas, uh, 1976, which is 35 years ago. And we actually had two earthquakes about 10 minutes apart. This would be a magnitude five earthquake. And when you say magnitude 5, we're talking about the Richter scale? The Richter scale, that would be a way of sizing, you know, saying the size of the earthquake. So obviously, if you look at the pen and ink here, this one's bigger than that one. So this is a bigger magnitude than that. Now, we've got recordings here that, that go back in time. Uh, I wanted to mention that, you know, sometimes the earth is noisy. Um, I could look at this record here. This is from a recording uh, in 2010. Here's the little earthquake, but you see all the wiggles there. We can't see the time works. This earthquake occurred during the winter time. There are big storms out in the oceans and that causes the earth to move. And we see that even here in St. Louis where we're basically about a thousand miles away from the Atlantic Ocean. So you're so telling me the equipment would pick up like the, the waves picks crashing up against the shore. The, yeah, the, the equipment picks up how the ground moved wow. in St. Louis. Now, um, here are some other recordings, uh, different type of, of scale where we see two earthquakes here. This is a local earthquake. That's a distant earthquake. That's because I've studied these. But this is a very interesting one. You notice it's different. This was not recorded with colored ink on a, on a piece of white paper. This is a smoke paper. So they would take a piece of paper, hold it in front of an alcohol lamp, get smoke on it, and then they have a little needle that would trace off the carbon. This is an actual recording of an earthquake on June 6th, 1911. It's an earthquake in Mexico, recorded here at St. Louis, and the recording was about this high, and the ground motion in St. Louis was about a millimeter. So basically, we have a record, you know, a record, an archive of historical earthquakes People are still studying these earthquakes to learn more about them. As we continue to look at that one, we've got some video of this, of this piece of equipment over right, here, right. which was actually your seismograph, That's which the we first used instrument in 1909. In, in Let's Louis. run that video now so people can see the video of the actual instrument that would have probably recorded this earthquake back in 1911. And, talk and it about was that. one of the first instruments in, in the United States. Uh, at that time, St. Louis University and other universities imported this world-class instrument from um, Germany and uh, started recording earthquakes. Now, this was a, an instrument that recorded directly on a piece of paper, on a smoke paper. What you're looking there is the, the uh, reproduction of that, but it's been reversed in color. Um, this, you know, this thing was operating here at St. Louis University up until about 1960. Wow. So there you see how equipment used to look. You'll have a nice comparison to what we're going to look at in a bit. We're going to look this seismogram. We're going to look at, so we saw seismograms there. We saw some little earthquakes uh -huh. in Missouri. This is a recording of how St. Louis moved during the Great Alaskan Earthquake, Good Friday Earthquake in 1964. So this you'll is see, how St. Louis's Earth reacted to that earthquake we showed right. you on video from Anchorage, Alaska. So you see that at the beginning of the day, the lines are very straight, it's very quiet, and all of a sudden, everything starts moving. So um, the recent earthquake in, um, in Japan, St. Louis moved up and down about this much. Now, it moved up and down that much over a period of about five minutes. It was very slow. No one felt it, but the ground does move up and down globally if there's a big earthquake. 
Very cool. A question that came into us via email is, how can a quake be given the wrong magnitude right away? Sometimes it changes. You know, we'll learn <coughs> like it was a 7.2 and then they change it like a 6.8. Well, that's part of the, the, I don't want to say it's a problem, the magnitude scales. We have different ways that look at different parts of the seismogram to get the size of the earthquake. Uh, we all know that if you've got light bulbs today, you've got a wattage which says, here's how much energy it takes to generate the light. But if you look at different 60 watt light bulbs, you might get mm -hmm. something looks like a yellow light, something looks like a bright blue light. The amount of light coming out of it differs. So the magnitude scale um, is looking at different parts of the earthquake. So, uh, you know, different effects of the earthquake. One scale, which gives the final size, is called a moment magnitude, and that's looking at the big deformation okay. of the earthquake. So um, the idea came from astronomy. Astronomers have a, um, a magnitude scale for the brightness of the stars, but they have a different scale for different color stars. So we're not trying to confuse you, but for <laughs> us it provides the information that helps us to really understand the earthquake itself. Well, let's see one happen, so to speak. We've got these seismograms, and right here we've got a piece of equipment, which is a seismograph, right? and it has a sensor on it here. Right. And it is this sensor that would register right. activity? Right. So if I actually jump up and down here, we're going to see this seismograph yeah. Just move. Just look so there we'll sure at the needle. The camera is there. So we're going to see the needle right here. And you're going to see that there is some massive right. activity here from this earthquake as a result of that. And in essence, whew, that's a very exciting moment in time. In essence, um, that's what's being recorded all the time. They're just that's right. The sensors right. Are what what the sensor out. does is the sensor converts the movement of the ground to an electrical voltage, just like a microphone in, in, in your cell phones will convert sound into an electrical voltage. That then goes to a set of amplifiers and then to the particular recorder. The other part that makes this a scientific instrument is a very good clock so we know what time the recordings came in. Now this type of recording was a portable instrument that people would take on their backpacks and go <laughs> study earthquakes. They were stronger back then um, and they were students because students work hard. <laughs> um, and uh, this is really developed about 40 years ago. Today everything is based on computers. It's smaller, it's digital, it's better quality quality data. But this illustrates, you'll notice then, you have a piece of paper on a drum. The drum is turning and as time goes on the pen is moving in that direction. So that's what's going to give you a recording that goes from time increases from left to right and from top to, to bottom. Now you mentioned more modern things. Some of these pieces of equipment we've got over here on the right are more are right. modern, right? Well some of these are, well we'll get to the modern okay. in a minute. That instrument there, everything's in a case. The reason it's in a case is that we bury this thing underground and we can't have water affected. But the inside of that would be similar to, to this. There's a coil wire, there's a magnet here. As the coil wire moves up and down, it generates a, uh, an electrical voltage. So when the ground moves, you will now see that this coil wire is moving in mm. the magnetic field. So that's the basis, was the historical basis of a type of seismograph in the past. Modern instruments are, each one of these is a, is a work of art. There's a, a wonderful mm -hmm. machinist that made all these things. Well, today we've learned to do things a little bit better. Um, this instrument here is sort of a, a world-class instrument that'll, that'll really be for studying distant earthquakes. And right in here, we will see the individual sensors. Each one of those is similar to that. Um, we have things from different manufacturers. Um, this is uh, made by a company in Canada. Um, this one was made in England. This is a smaller version of that. All these are designed to be very sensitive, to record small earthquakes nearby or big earthquakes worldwide. This one here is not a sensitive instrument. That thing is designed so that if there is very strong shaking, and if we look at carefully at this thing, this thing is meant to be bolted to, to the ground so that when the ground moves, it doesn't fly around. This thing is going to record the big, strong motion that causes the shaking of buildings, the damage of the buildings. So, so the engineers 
are going to be very interested in the recording from that particular device. Very cool. I know you students have more questions, and I want to remind our interactive groups that if you, get, if you have questions in your mind that we don't get to ask during today's program, then simply email them to us at live at hectv.org, and I can send them to Bob, and we can answer them after the program as well. And don't forget, if you're watching on the internet or television, it's live at hectv.org. Let's go to Yonkers for one question, then we'll go to Chippewa Falls for one question. Take it away, Yonkers. Is the rate or magnitude of an earthquake um, affected by weather, by cold weather? Oh, excellent. Is the rate or magnitude of an earthquake affected by weather at all? Like in cold weather, is it more, in, in, will that change at no, all? No, there, there's no real relationship between what happens in weather and what happens with, with respect to earthquakes. Earthquakes are a process that occur over hundreds of years. Weather is a process that occurs over a very short period of time. What is interesting is both of those phenomena, you know, things we worry about, is generated by heat energy. Heat energy causes the inside of the Earth to move, which gives rise to earthquakes. Heat energy is what causes the atmosphere to move that gives us um, everything going on, severe storms and all other phenomena. Thank you for the question, Yonkers. Chippewa Falls, a question from you. How fast and how far can an earthquake travel from the epicenter? Ooh, what a great question. One, you mentioned the word epicenter, which is obviously the place where the earthquake is right. centered at. Great use of that term. How fast and how far can an earthquake move from that epicenter is the Chippewa Falls question. You, well, the earthquake will not move. That's where the earthquake the is. The sound heard. waves. We want to talk about how fast the seismic waves. Uh, there are two waves that come out. The first wave is a push-pull wave. That travels at about, oh, 6,000 meters per second. Uh, the other wave is, is a, a wave in which there is a, a horizontal motion as the wave uh, propagates. That travels at about 3,500 meters per second. For perspective, sound travels at 300 meters per second. So that means that this compressional wave, this push-pull wave, is about 20 times faster than the speed of sound. This particular wave, which causes the damage, is about 10 times the speed of sound. Well, we've, we've got a video that shows, based on the transportable array, the sound wave, how the earthquake right. moves out from a specific epicenter. So we're going to show you that video now of this array. This earthquake happened in Oklahoma, and you'll see the speed at which the, da the earthquake sound waves move out from where the epicenter is located. There's a big experiment now where 400 instruments are being moved across the continental United States, and when they hit to the Atlantic Ocean, some of those instruments are going to go up into Alaska. And what we're seeing is that the earthquake occurs, uh, they'll rerun it, well, when you look at it again on the web, you'll see the earthquake occur, you'll see everything's quiet, and then you'll see a bunch of big motion when the... We're going to run it again. So right, there it, it is. And so we'll see the P wave and the S wave come out. So uh, Chuck Amon at Penn State University is the, one of the first ones that you know, made this little movie. Uh, so we, we learned things from this. It, it's good to illustrate the wave propagation that energy is transferred from the earthquake to large distances by the seismic waves. Does the, oh, expanding on the, the cold weather question that we got, Parkway is interested in knowing, is there anything in relationship to the moon's gravitational pull? Does that affect earthquakes at all? Well, the sun the also has a gravitational okay. pull, right. and every day St. Louis moves up and down because of the solid earth tides. We know about tides in the ocean, but the earth also responds because, believe it or not, rock is not that hard. It actually moves. Uh, but the uh, relationship, there, there is no real relationship between earthquakes and the movement of the tides. They have a follow-up question in terms of the Japanese quake. They heard that it actually, the Japan quake in the spring actually altered the Earth's orientation. How well, does it do that? Well, or, remember, or, um, even though there are no you know, children toys anymore of tops, but mm -hmm. uh, basically, Think of an ice skater doing a pirouette, and you've seen this both for ba uh, ballet dancers and ice skaters, that they're spinning around, and all of a sudden when they bring their body in, you know, their arms in closer, they spin, uh, they, they spin faster. That's called a conservation of angular momentum in physics. So basically what's happening, the Earth is spinning, and if the earthquake causes the ground to move up and down, it's going to change how fast the earthquake spins. 
Well, obviously, we're here because, it, at, in terms of time frame, because it's the 200th anniversary of these massive earthquakes we heard about from New Madrid that the world kind of refers to now as the New Madrid quakes of 1811 and 1812. We want to give the students some information about them and the likelihood of the New Madrid uh, kind of faults happening again. We've got uh, some images which show you the earthquake locations from 1811 and 1812. And so this picture that you're going to see, you're going to see a whole bunch of earthquakes that happened uh, in this, from this old map. So we're talking big scale, right? These were like 7.9, 8.0 earthquakes? Well, we don't, we, there were no instruments then. Uh -huh. So our, our guesses as to the size of the earthquake are really based on what damage the earthquake did and how far uh, you know, uh, the people were away that, that felt the earthquake. And uh, but you know, until California was settled by the United States, these were known as the big earthquakes in North America. Well, you mentioned the wave that went out. We've got an image right. that is, a, in essence, a representation of what they believe the wave was like from the pneumatic Yeah, that quakes. would be an image a, a, uh, indicating the degree of shaking that could have been caused by the earthquake. The red color indicates there would have been severe damage, uh, the green minor damage. And when you go out to very large distance, such as up in um, New York or the eastern United States, the earthquake was widely felt. And so the stories that they, the church bells rang in Boston, those kinds of stories would have been accurate, I think other investigators think? have discounted that one, but it certainly was widely felt. Uh, you know, we've got to remember, there were no cameras at that time. There was no YouTube. No one took photographs. There were no instruments. So the researchers had to go back to old diaries and old newspapers. And um, there was one professor at St. Louis University, Otto Nutley, that went back to, uh, to university libraries and read all these old newspapers. And we've heard the, the tale that the Mississippi River actually ran backwards during this earthquake. Accurate? Did the Mississippi River shift course? Well, where, why, why where the image? reports were and from what we see in the earthquakes, the answer is yes, it probably did happen. But where the earthquakes occur is, is uh, overlain by deep sediments, maybe 600 meters or 2,000 feet of river deposit. So if the earthquake caused an uplift, it stopped the Mississippi for a little bit of time, but the mighty Mississippi cut right through all that soil, mm -hmm. so it did not last very long. Now this image we're seeing of, of the sand boils, sand right. blows, this is how we know that there's activity or things right. going around this New Madrid area. Sand, sand blows are called, also called little sand volcanoes, and what these are is, this was all uh, river valley for, for thousands and thousands of years. The Mississippi River went back and forth. The river deposits gravel and sand and clay. And so you would have layers of clay, which is very hard to get through, over sand. And then with the particular shaking, um, the, the sand grains will settle just like people walking on the beach. Water will come up and there are forces that, that push it, you know, it punctures through that cap, through this, the uh, clay. The sand will spread out on the surface. That particular area there, um, we know that there has been great shaking down there. People have gone there and looked for evidence of earthquakes before 1811, 1812. Farmers down there know you can't grow stuff in sand very well, and they know <laughs> not to plant stuff in, in certain areas down there. But that's certainly evidence that there was a great deal of shaking. Other earthquakes in the world have been uh, photographs in California, uh, photographs in, in Japan you see just about the same features. Very good. Students, let's go to more questions from you all. Let's go back up to Wisconsin. Chippewa Falls, a question from you. What place in the world gets the most earthquakes? Oh, that's a cool question. What place in the world gets the most earthquakes? Um, the place in the world where we see most of the earthquakes is probably the country of Indonesia. And that's just at a plate boundary between the Australian plate and the, uh, Watch. The, the Asian plate. Well, yeah. so, the so, world, so the world will know. I'll ask you guys uh, back in the production studio to bring us the plate tectonic image, which I believe was image two. So you'll see the plate tectonic image, but we can also then show you on image two where Indonesia is located, and you'll see that it's in the, south, the, the seas of, below Southeast Asia. So you see where Australia is. If you go just up and left, then that's where you'll find Indonesia, and you'll see that there's all sorts of redness there. But, but in general, if we go past Indonesia, where the, the big earthquakes occur are really on where you have the convergent plate boundaries, where the two plates are bumping into each other, which would be along the, um, the Aleutian Island arc, uh, along Japan, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and then going northeast of, of um, Australia. Uh, out in the mid-Atlantic ridges where the plates are pulling apart, you have earthquakes, but they're not as big and not as frequent as those that occur in the uh, 
the convergent plate boundaries. Now the students have had some questions about predictability and, and, and obviously we're interested in, in thinking about this location also and thinking about the future. So let's talk a little bit about the future of earthquake science. If, for example, um, this, uh, an earthquake on what we believe was the scale of New Madrid in 1811 and 1812 were happening today, I mean, then we're talking about few population in this area, right. obviously no business whatsoever. Right. The same kind of thing would be significantly much more damaging. Oh, it would be significant. Uh, the, we have to remember that an earthquake uh, you know, affects people immediately um, by you know, the destruction of their buildings and by injuries. Uh, earthquakes can have other effects. Um, we have a thing called a lifeline. Um, right through this area, we've got a lot of natural gas and petroleum pipelines. We've got highway bridges, railway bridges, and if any of those things are disrupted, that's going to affect an even greater portion of, of the United States. Now, I know we've got something in terms of the future of so earthquake science called the PAGER system, P-A-G-E-R, yep. which stands for what? Prompt Assessment of Global Earthquake Risk. This is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey who uh, at their National Earthquake Information Center, they're connected to thousands of instruments worldwide. Within minutes of an earthquake, they know where it is. Within a few more minutes after an earthquake, within 10 minutes or so, they've got a first estimate of how big it was. They then use that to estimate what was the area, what was the shaking, how many people were affected, and what the economic loss could be. So within... And we have an image for that Good. that we'll bring back up. The students just saw this image of the pager system and we're going to identify for you what the three things are in the image and what they represent that Bob just spoke to. So in the left hand side of it we've got the actual earthquake occurring in Oklahoma and you guys can see where the epicenter is where the most red is and then there's some waves that move out from that. And then down at the on the right hand side they actually list cities and towns that are likely to be affected by the waves of damage, correct? Right. Or this, being worse, I'm assuming. Right. This would be an estimate of the degree of shaking, and they're trying to say how many people could have been affected by strong shaking, uh, moderate shaking, or just how many people would have felt that. So, and then at the bottom, we see the potential for fatalities and yeah, economic loss. This is just loss. a quick estimate. Now, remember, after the earthquake occurs, a lot of people are going to be notified. In the United States, you're going to have uh, government agencies, uh, Department of Defense, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, you're going to be notifying state governments because what we really want to do after an earthquake is we want to quickly have estimate what are the effects of the earthquake so that we can instruct people to get down there with the rescue equipment. Very good. Thank you Parkway for the email question that you've gotten and then we're going to go to more interactive questions from our groups in New York and Wisconsin. What country is best known for earthquake codes for buildings? Should we assume that Japan is the most advanced since they deal with them frequently or is, is the oh. U.S. actually better at that? Or? Some of the states in the United States have earthquake uh, you know, codes to say you, you do this when you make your building just to be strong. Japan worries about it. Um, other countries are beginning to worry about it, but it all depends you know, on, on enforcement. Is uh, someone going to check it when the building's being built? Uh, it also depends upon how rich the country is. So Japan has historically been affected by big earthquakes. Japan has a big earthquake problem. Yes, and you guys might hear every once in a while about them taking roads and bridges and retrofitting them so they're appropriate for earthquakes and that kind of thing. That's happening a lot in the St. Louis area. Let's go back to our student groups. Yonkers, do you have a question for us now? If so, go right ahead and ask it. Can people cause earthquakes? Can, can people cause earthquakes or can human activity cause earthquakes in any way? Or the, the, Obviously, human activity can't cause an earthquake in the way we think of it from the earth moving, but the damage potential? We, we have learned that human activity can cause earthquakes, oh. you know, not huge earthquakes. Uh -huh. We know that if you pump liquids underground, it might cause the friction of the false to be, fault to be weakened so there's movement. There were uh, case studies in uh, Colorado, in the Denver, Colorado in the 1960s, water was being pumped down to great depths and all of a sudden earthquakes were caused. Uh, we also know that there was an, an earthquake in India, in western India, in the year 1966 by a big reservoir where the weight of the water, the fluid of the water seeping down through the cracks gave rise to a big wow. earthquake. So, we are aware that people can change the properties of the shallow part of the earth which might give rise to earthquakes and so people that, big build, that build big dams want to make sure that that dam is strong enough to withstand any possible earthquake. Very cool question Yonkers, thanks for that, those are great examples. Do it, does a small earthquake mean a larger one is coming? 
Does a small earthquake automatically mean another larger one is coming? Not, not necessarily. We really don't know the relationship between you know, a small earthquake. You know, if it comes right before a big earthquake, after the fact, we'll say it was a foreshock. Okay. Uh, it just is an indication that there is a zone of weakness there that earthquakes occur, and we should worry about that in the future. Recently, we've known in Oklahoma for the last two years that, uh, near Oklahoma City that there have been a lot of earthquakes that have been widely felt. And what just happened uh, early in the month of November is, you know, there was a magnitude 4.7. Hey, that's a good size earthquake for us. Well, uh, a short time later, all of a sudden, there was a 5.6 earthquake. And that was huge. We had not expected that one. Chippewa Falls, back to you for a question. Does, the, does an earthquake move on water or just on land? Oh, does an earthquake move on water or just on land? You no, know, an earthquake only, well, first of all, the earthquake must be a movement of rock. But the waves that the earthquake generates, um, they propagate through the earth. The, some of the waves propagate through water, and some of those things propagate through the air. So some people, there are some very small earthquakes that generate high frequencies. Some people can hear them. And of course, then, in, in many instances, we may be dealing with a tsunami, some water movement as a result of an earthquake. That's, like we that's did in Japan, another, another effect of an earthquake. You know, as I said, you know, an earthquake by itself might only affect the immediate area, but the effects of the earthquake could cause disruption. And certainly a tsunami, when it generates this big wave, that wave can propagate thousands of miles and affect people anywhere. So we know that uh, in Hawaii, uh, they're worried about tsunamis, but they're not worried about tsunamis from earthquakes in Hawaii. They're worried about big earthquakes in Chile or Japan or uh, Alaska that send these waves down to Hawaii, and then when it slams into Hawaii, you have uh, destruction of communities. I know I've driven along the coast in Washington and Oregon, and you see the signs that say like tsunami zone or tsunami right. evacuation zone. These students may be very interested in, in earthquakes in a lot of different ways, but if they're thinking about a career in geoscience or studying earthquakes, what, what are the kinds of things that, you know, if you're interested in earthquakes, careers might be affected by? Well, basically, we're studying the Earth, and we're studying what's inside the Earth. And the immediate application right now would be exploration for oil and natural gas. Um, another important thing that we're worried about are to prepare for the, fu the effects of fu future earthquakes. So that leads into, I would be interested in how the ground shakes because of an earthquake. Well, that information is useful to engineers who want to design a building that would be safe for that particular earthquake. So uh, many things of, of today that we're working on or using, you know, it's, it's pure research, knowledge, you know, obtaining knowledge for the purpose of, of learning more. But we're also interested in, in public safety and saving lives. As we get close to the end of the program here, we've got about two and a half minutes left. Is there some important information about earthquakes, the future of earthquake science, something you want to leave the students with we haven't had a chance to cover yet, Bob? Oh, the, so much uh, to say in two and a half minutes. Right. <laughs> The, uh, I think the important thing I want the students to, you know, to know is that they have the tools now that I did not have as a student to really observe natural disasters. So you can, as I said, they have mentioned before in the program, you can go on the web and immediately after the earthquake, you can see earthquake damage. You can participate in the problems of the people worldwide. You will also know that earthquakes, um, you know, not only do they affect the local area, but they affect the global economy. So we know right now that it's Christmas time, people worried about gifts and everything else. We know that the big earthquake in Japan affected the Japanese economy, but they also affected exports as to what we can buy now. This is months after the earthquake. We also know that other things are becoming scarce because of natural disasters. Uh, the students will have recalled in the last month or so, there was severe flooding in the country of Thai Thailand. And well, that disrupted factories that are making disk drives that are going mm -hmm. into computers. So we're all connected right now. Uh, and uh, you know, we're no longer isolated. Um, earthquakes affect the world, they, they affect the world population. Um, the world is a lot more complicated now, a lot more interconnected. So uh, I think it's important for students to, to realize that, to be aware that there's a world outside of themselves, uh, that there are going to be many disciplines going to be required in the future. Some of the students will want to go into medicine. Other students will want to go into sciences. 
uh, just continue to learn. Very cool. Uh, if you've got more questions that you weren't able to get involved in during the program, then don't forget to email them to us at live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. If you want to see more resources about earthquakes, you want to see some examples of like seismograms from earthquakes in history, you want to learn more about the New Madrid earthquakes, then you can go to the St. Louis University Earthquake Center uh, website, right. which has a lot of fantastic information, Bob. Right, and there are other websites out there. Our, our website, um, provides history, provides links to where earthquakes are occurring now. Uh, we have a lot of photographs that were collected over the years from, if you want to see photographs of earthquakes, the Charleston, South Carolina earthquake in 1886, we have copies of original photographs and we have uh, pictures of recent earthquakes, so. Great. Bob, thanks so much My for pleasure. being with us Thank this you. morning. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to join you. Thanks you to our interactive schools for joining us and to all the folks joining us over the web. Any other email questions we get in, we'll respond to them. Uh, by sending those answers back to you via email. It's been a great opportunity to talk about the science behind earthquakes here at the St. Louis University Earthquake Center. This program will be archived and available online at our website in just about a week, so look for it there. Bye everybody, thanks for joining us on HEC TV Live.